Welcome to our College Scholar Speaker event tonight. You know that you are here to see Dr. James Liker do Rage of the Rural Minority. And I am Ty Edwards. I'm a history professor and director of the Kansas Studies Institute. And I am here to introduce Dr. Liker. So you probably know he's a history professor. He's a chair of our department, which is the History and Political Science Department. He's a leader on campus in every way. I was going through his CV. I think he's been on every committee, like twice, three times, four times, something like that. He was a Fulbright Scholar in 2007. He's a three-time Distinguished Service Award winner here at JCCC. And he literally helped found this College Scholar program. And he has been the College Scholar before. So this is a very Dr. Liker aspect of his service to our college. He's a prolific scholar, um, which is sometimes an anomaly in community colleges because of our heavy teaching load. And so to make time to write scholarship is a Herculean task. He has two books, Racial Borders, Black Soldiers Along the Rio Grande, and The Northern Cheyenne Exodus in History and Memory. And I don't know if my memory is correct, but that's the last college scholar talk I remember going to, yeah. So that was in 2011, co-authored with Raymond Powers. And he's published 1,547 articles. I just exaggerated a little bit, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's a lot, <laughs> it's a lot. Uh, and he's done numerous interviews, the most recent one, which I watched on my phone with headphones while I was parenting. Uh, it was on KCUR's Up to Date called What's Missing from Our American History Classes? And he was there with one of our high school instructors from the area talking about how we teach American history. So he has a very robust resume. He's a prolific scholar. He's done a lot of service to our institution. But the thing that most impresses me about Dr. Liker's career is his service to the state. He was educated with his bachelor's and master's degree at Fort Hayes State University, and he got his PhD at KU. And now he's taking the education he received in public colleges and universities, and he's turning around and educating Kansans in a public college. That's the service that I find impressive. He's on the editorial board of Kansas History, which I like to joke is the journal of Jim Liker, because he's either publishing original scholarship or cited in the scholarship that's in that journal. I cited Jim Liker when I published in that journal, so I can relate. Uh, he's a former president just last year of the Kansas Association of Historians. He's the founder of JCCC's Kansas Studies Institute, of which I'm now director. Uh, and he won a League of Innovation Award for founding that institute, which promotes the research and teaching on culture, history, economics, and the natural environment of Kansas. And much of his scholarship, including what you're going to hear tonight and what he did last week for the College Scholars Program, is directly related to Kansas. His scholarship, his career, his service has all focused on this. Everything from, and is it Antonino? Antonino, Kansas, uh, a changing village on the plains, imagining the free state, 150 year history of a contested image, race relations in the sunflower state, cholera among the plain Indians, that's one I cited, uh, black soldiers at Fort Hayes, Kansas, and challenging the color line in Kansas and Nebraska are just some of his works that deal with Kansas history. So to me, the thing that makes Dr. Liker's career and service impressive is that he's the model of what I want to do with my career. I want to serve the state that invested in me in the way Jim serves the state that invested in him. So, take it away, Dr. Liker. Well, thank you, Dr. Edwards, for that humbling introduction and for the great work you do with Kansas Studies Institute. Um, I want to thank a couple of other people. So Farrell Janab, who coordinates this for staff and organizational development, um, has been responsible for all of the promotion. So wherever Farrell is, there she is. Um, I also want to give a shout out to a group that often gets neglected, and that's our library staff. Every researcher's best friend is the librarian. And I'm also going to thank the Johnson County Community College Sabbatical Committee because the research that you're hearing tonight partly came about because of a release that I got in the fall of 2015. So um, I don't think it's any secret, most of you are aware, that I come from an agricultural background in western Kansas. But you may not be aware that I actually did grow up in town. Um, now I have to qualify this. The town that I grew up in, in southern Ellis County, 
our entire population was less than the number of people in this room right this minute. <laughs> Counting the stray dogs and cats, and if you let the livestock out, which did occasionally happen and they ran free, um, then it might top what we've got in this room. My first experience with formal education was in an elementary school located in an old WPA building on which my grandfather was the construction foreman back in 1939. And the year that I left in the sixth grade was the year they closed down the school. I don't think those two things were related, but um, the year that I left, the school had 18 children. There were four in my sixth grade class. I was the only boy. And I've always carried those memories with me, and so it, it makes tonight's topic for me a little bit personal. In 1992, I immigrated to the Lawrence and Johnson County area. And I say that partly because I'm trying to be cute, but it is kind of accurate. Because I would argue that there is more of a gulf between Antonino, Kansas, and Overland Park than there is between Overland Park and Amsterdam, maybe even between Overland Park and Johannesburg, South Africa. That is, the gulf between rural and urban in America today, I think, informs almost everything we can talk about. And I'm not the only Kansan who feels this way. This sense of being an immigrant, um, I think, is appropriate, is, at least it's an appropriate analogy. Because like any person who moves from a place that they're very familiar with into a new environment, you do learn to assimilate over time. But there's always this kind of realization in the front of your mind that this is not really where I'm from. Um, you know, I'm, I'm in this place, but I'm not really of it. So I'm going to start with a few boring tables. Um, this is the 2010 population density by Kansas counties, 105 of them total. And you pr notice here that we in Kansas like our lines to be rectangular um, <laughs> to each other. So you see where the greatest population density is located. Sedgwick County, of course, Wichita, and where we are in the northeastern part of the state. So if every one of those counties had roughly identical population, then this is what it would look like. But I'm fond of these kinds of maps, which shows every county drawn in proportion to the number of people who occupy it. Now this is from the year 1900, and as you can tell, even then, the population of Kansas leaned quite a bit to the east. Keep your eye, though, on those far western counties. It looks like a whale, so look at the whale's tail. And what you see 30 years later in 1930 is that those far western counties that I'll be talking about this evening actually did pick up a few in numbers. But notice here where Wichita 1930, notice the difference in 1960. What you're seeing there is the advent of the Second World War and the development of the airplane industry. And by the time you get to the last census in 2010, the state looks like this. So a lot has been written and said about the vast majority of Kansans who live in a handful of nine or 10 counties. My talk tonight deals with everybody else. So it's unlikely that the founders of the United States, especially Thomas Jefferson, ever envisioned a time when farmers would comprise a numerically insignificant part of the population. No recent development clarifies this more than the family farm crisis of the late 20th century. On the high plains of eastern Colorado and western Kansas, Family-owned farms, like family-owned stores and restaurants, have endured painful transitions to a corporatized, globally integrated economy. Three organizations in particular, women involved in farm economics, the American agriculture movement, and the Sheriff's Posse Comitatus, reflect the efforts of farmers and rural people to find collective solutions through political means. These groups also provided expressions of rage manifestations of anger against government, consumers, and urban elites who seemed to understand little about farm life, yet held farmers' destinies in their hands. The term minority has endured many permutations since its initial use by sociologists in the early 20th century. With some justification, farm activists appropriated the title in the late 1970s, demanding government protection as an oppressed group while, ironically, denouncing government's perceived drift 
towards socialism. Despite the contradiction, the assertion of oppressed minority status is not mere rhetoric. These groups aggressively claimed agriculture as a cultural identity and not simply an economic occupation, with farmers retaining a special place in American society. The farm crisis evolved over several decades. So the number of United States farms dropped by half between 1950 and 1970. Smaller, less competitive farmers folded with the admonition of get big or get out ringing in their ears. Dependent on winter wheat, Plains farmers were especially vulnerable. The 1973 Soviet wheat deal temporarily increased their income by raising grain prices, producing paper millionaires as land values became hyperinflated. The deal, however, proved disastrous by end of the decade when grain prices plummeted, which was one consequence of the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan and the Carter administration's breaking off of trade relations. Simultaneously, rapid increases in oil costs, stimulated by the OPEC embargo, made gas-powered machinery more expensive to operate. Paradoxically, farmers who incurred debt to invest heavily in land purchases and machinery, becoming the most efficient producers in the industry, grew most financially at risk. Between 1935 and 1975, the number of farms in Kansas, Colorado, Nebraska, and both Dakotas declined from more than 600,000 to fewer than 300,000. Conversely, the average farm size in those states more than doubled. These woes spilled into the adjacent communities. From 1950 to 1990, 45 of Kansas's 105 counties lost not only people, but schools, churches, and businesses, which I can attest to. The population itself grew steadily older. So in 1950, when a future AIM or wife activist might have been born, more than half of Plains counties already had a higher percentage than national average of people aged 65 and older. In 2000, that percentage stood at more than 80%, which means that the then 50-year-old activist would still be a relative youngster in his or her community of birth. That's why I like to go back to Western Kansas often. I will always be younger. <laughs> the historian Shane Hamilton has employed the term neopopulism to describe the country-bred ideology of anti-union, anti-corporate, libertarian capitalism voiced by rural radicals. Neopopulism accommodated an array of fears, fears of government conspiracy, urban liberalism, and most significantly, attacks on traditional gender roles. If rural men viewed the crisis as an assault on their individual worth as providers, rural women feared its impact on social units like community and family. This plea by Dolores Elliott in the American Agriculture News, Ames newspaper, describes farming as the nuclear family's ultimate refuge. Can you, our city friends, imagine living in an unlocked world? We do. We still go to bed at night with our cars and trucks unlocked, and yes, even our home. We realize the crime rate is growing rapidly, but we still have enough trust and faith to feel safe on our farm. Farm divisions, or farm households divisions of labor were never as rigid as urbanites might suppose. Adolescent girls drove tractors, moved livestock from pastures, hauled hay bales, and performed whatever chores were needed if men were not available, and sometimes even when they were. Women also provided the fundamental and socially expected role of community building, of organizing church picnics, taking food to grieving families, sponsoring 4-H chapters, and countless other tasks. So if you take the farm itself as a business enterprise with kids as employees, then wives were simultaneously the manager, the accountant, the HR director, the public relations specialist, and when the need arose, political lobbyist. As such, women were no less invested than their male relatives in defending rural life from outside threats that posed more than mere economic danger. Like urban women, many farm wives entered the workforce in the 1970s, less from feminist ideals than from the need to supplement household income. Once the crisis deepened, and families faced possible foreclosure and eviction, 
wives' incomes became crucial. But a town job means inflexible hours, which leaves less time for church and school functions, and fewer opportunities for community building at exactly the time when depopulation threatened small communities the most. Activist farm women voiced a very different set of concerns from their city colleagues. Peggy Ahrensman from Kinsley, Kansas, described her reaction to a rural women's conference in Washington, D.C. They kept telling me that I didn't need to be shackled to this farmer and that farm, that I needed to be liberated. And I said, well, I'm more liberated than I want to be. Anything that I want to run or anything my husband wants me to run or do, I attempt to do. I don't think there's any business in the United States where the wives are more involved. Farming is such an all-encompassing project that the men are needed on the farm and the women can more easily get away for a few days. As a result, they created other outlets for idealism. In 1976, women in Sydney, Nebraska created WIFE, Women Involved in Farm Economics, as a grassroots organization dedicated to, quote, preserving the family farm and the quality of life in rural America. WIFE opened chapters from Texas to the Dakotas, its official correspondence emblazoned with the slogan, Hell hath no fury like a woman scorned. You see here the letterhead motif of a woman with a pitchfork as if ready to defend her home. Wife lobbied for an end to cheap food imports and price freezes and for parity in agricultural commodities. In offering to rural women an alternate form of feminism, one more consistent with a conservative worldview, it actually articulated better than its male counterpart, the neopopulist fears. In the 1990s, Kansas wife chapters opposed National Park Service acquisition of tall grass prairies in the Flint Hills by emphasizing the positive record of private landowners as environmental stewards. Wife's contemporary website lists a number of positions that we can safely classify as conservative, opposing regulation, the United Nations, benefits for undocumented immigrants, and protection of endangered species, all of those things they're against but also taking positions that might attract moderate coalition builders. These include enforcement of anti-monopoly laws and support for affordable health care and public programs that draw doctors to rural areas. In a time of seismic political shifts, rural movements' future on the rightward side of the spectrum was far from predestined. Rural protests, in fact, often had a leftist feel drawing sympathy from the ACLU and from a coalition of churches, unions, and celebrities. In the 1980s, Willie Nelson's farm aid concerts drew the nation's attention to Iowa, while Jesse Jackson's Rainbow Coalition made some pretty impressive strides in Midwestern areas. In 1983, Reverend Jackson, who was then a Democratic presidential candidate, pitched his Rainbow Coalition to a standing room only crowd at Barton County Community College in Great Bend, Kansas. Reserving nearly half the 800 seat auditorium for wife and AIM members, Jackson addressed an enthusiastic audience about the common interest of farmers and African Americans in feeding the hungry. As he wrote, or as he said, the tragedy of this hour is the feeders are starving. We must move from racial battleground to economic common ground and figure out a way to survive together. While he was there, Jackson visited a local farm, he helped to feed livestock, and he tried to inspire hope that farmers would join a coalition that would rock the Democrats and force other candidates to take farm issues seriously. As a result, Wife and AIM both warmly endorsed Jackson's goal and his candidacy. Progressivism's emphasis on rational solutions to material problems, however, had an intrinsic disadvantage in farm country. The problems they faced there were more than political and economic, they were also cultural and psychological. On the one hand, farmers constructed self-identities as curators, heirs to a family legacy accumulated over multiple generations and tied to one particular piece of land with the responsibility to preserve and bequeath to children and grandchildren. On the other hand, farmers also conceived of themselves as entrepreneurial capitalists, cunningly able to compete and prosper in a dog-eat-dog -dog world. 
Farmers who mortgaged their homes to expand acreage and buy more land and equipment probably did not recognize the irreconcilable tension these identities created. A real entrepreneur avoids mixing business investments with sentimentality and is ready to abandon an enterprise and reinvest elsewhere when market forces make doing so a necessity. But the coal logic of detached capitalism did not apply to the farmer's role as curator. Shame belonged to the farmer who broke the generational link and lost the farm, admitting to the world and to, pros and to posterity that he was less a man than his father and grandfather. Such weakness consigned his descendants to life in a rootless, dangerous urban world. This Jeffersonian mythos was perpetuated in films like Country, about a struggling family trying to avoid foreclosure, and by farmers themselves, who tended to approach survival on the land in Darwinian terms. In what philosophers might call an existential crisis, activists who sought to satisfy both these competing identities, the farmer as curator and the farmer as entrepreneur, often failed at both, leaving frustration and anger to guide their political behavior. I'm going to play a brief clip, thanks to the wonders of YouTube. This is the trailer from the 1984 film Country with Jessica Lange. So we won't watch the whole movie, just a minute and a half of it. So I hope you caught who the villain of that story was. Um, in an 87 second clip, they use the word college boy once, bureaucrats twice, and government three times. So. At AJ66 Station Cafe in Campo, Colorado in summer 1977, Alvin Jenkins, Daryl Schroeder and his son Gene, and three other large-scale wheat farmers launched the American Agriculture Movement. Ames' first meeting there on September 6th, with 140 in attendance, outlined plans for a national farm strike by all food and fiber producers. As the fall planting season ensued, 700 farmers postponed their field work as best they could to attend a large rally in nearby Springfield. As small tractor rallies appeared in mid-sized cities like Lubbock and Amarillo, the movement expanded with incredulous speed. Within four months, by the end of 1977, AIM opened more than 1,000 offices in more than 40 states. Amid cries of, hell no, we won't grow, they demanded a return to 100% parity a government-supported price on farm products that guaranteed the buying power of agriculture's supposed golden age during the 1910s. 3,000 protesters drove their equipment into Washington, D.C. in January 1978, snarling traffic and carrying signs saying, Farmer, the most important minority in America. Now, the few scholarly studies which examine the American agriculture movement agree that it failed. That conclusion might be accurate regarding its political goals, but it's less so when considering its cultural ones. Using food as a weapon, AIM activists hope to reassert farmer centrality in a society bent on satisfying urban consumers' interests. Al Jenkins asked God in a farmer's prayer to deliver understanding as to, quote, why a pound of T-bone steak at $1.80 is high, but a three-ounce cocktail at $2.20 is not. A certain defensiveness at being stereotyped as rude hillbillies, as well as a phobia of everything metropolitan, permeated their speeches and literature. This was especially the case among women, who resented the image of the farmer as, quote, the good old boy who came to town on Saturday with his cream and eggs, but had not earned the right to luxuries like a new car. In its rage in an America for which the family farm had become peripheral, AIM and wife posed an identity for rural people as a new oppressed minority. As one farmer I interview recalled, I guess it was the original ag version of the Tea Party. While most neo-populists denied any resemblance between their movement and the social upheavals of the 60s, the more astute acknowledged certain similarities, if only in retrospect. Interviewed decades later, one former activist admitted it probably did sink into the backs of our minds that maybe the young people had something going. Discourses about minority injustice, popularized by civil rights leaders, inevitably found their way into rural literature. At less than 4% of the population, we are a minority and have no political power. We, the American farmer, 
are tired of doing a better job feeding the world than we do our own families. Despite occasional recognition of the legitimacy of leftist causes and even borrowing of their methods, the bulk of AM followers resided in a world of conservative impulses. Letters to the American Agriculture News, or AAN, reveal paranoid concerns about one world government, the Rockefellers, Sierra Clubbers, and other environmental groups, and liberals generally who opposed pesticides, advocated gun control, used imported products and workers, and gave tax breaks to foreigners to buy rural property. The American agriculture movement creed declared, I am, get it, convinced, that United States farmland should be owned by red-blooded American family farmers. Journalist Kent Root remembered during the AIM years when two farmers in an Oklahoma City cafe inflicted their views on him in a very unsociable way that left him visibly shaken. He said, the era could only be called mass hysteria in the sense that people who had lived very quiet lives were rising up and doing outlandish things. Root called this an escape from reality by those who relished the chance to form an alliance with their brethren and charge onward toward the battle. This keen observation lay open the glaring question at the heart of neopopulist ideology. From their outset, AIM and other organizations seemed unable to decide between the pragmatic political goal of obtaining improved legislation, which necessitated support from mainstream voters and hence a moderate message and tone, or the abstract cultural one of unifying farmers into a nationalist movement, which required clear boundaries against outsiders and more extreme rhetoric and tactics. The louder, more visible leaders opted for the latter, choosing symbols which most distinguished the farmer from other Americans, not erased his differences. A Baptist, pre a Baptist preacher from Arkansas, preparing for the Washington Tractorcade, stopped his wife from packing his Sunday suit, telling her to pack his overalls instead. I want them to know I'm a farmer. More than overalls, the tractor represented not only rural discontent, but the industrial changes which transformed rural life. One farmer explained to me later, we just didn't feel safe or comfortable outside the cab of our tractor, so why not pick it with them? Farmers wore caps and belt buckles, identifying themselves as John Deere or Massey Ferguson men, and sometimes they got in fistfights over the difference. <laughs> Although the cost of brand new equipment ran in the tens of thousands of dollars and often comprised the lion's share of mortgage payments, farmers understood the tractor as a symbol of masculine power and liberation, not oppression. AIM appropriated this imagery in its Tractorcade Handbook, the preparatory manual for the convoy to D.C. in winter of 1979. The handbook's back page offered a reverse play on the theme of Manifest Destiny. The phrase, Eastward Ho the Tractors, recalled the mythic spirit of pioneer ancestors who conquered the frontier in Conestoga wagons, juxtaposed against the new industrial age when descendants of those pioneers, now driving diesel-powered equipment, roared to the nation's capital from their western homes to conquer corruption and injustice. This second tractorcade, larger than the first, saw 1,200 tractors from the Plains and Midwest heading eastward on interstate highways linked together in a 30 to 40 mile convoy. As you can imagine, urbanites in the congested district of Columbia didn't have a whole lot of sympathy. Four major convoys converged on the city's outskirts and produced a jam that backed up commuter traffic more than 10 miles, stranding motorists who shouted curses. Crawling up Pennsylvania Avenue to parking lots set aside near Capitol Hill, some protesters rammed the cruisers of the police directing them. Clashes between protesters and authorities continued for weeks, with several farmers arrested after doing an estimated $500,000 in damage, scarring and churning up the lawns on the mall. With King's Great March on Washington only 15 years past, it was reasonable for AIM leaders to suppose that the visual drama of mass protests enabled by television and other modern media would produce favorable results. But if their goal was to replicate the success of Selma, then they probably should have walked. 
Lacking the language and symbols to make their case to an urban constituency, AIM never convinced the typical consumer about its members' hardships. Images of farmers driving expensive equipment the size of small houses through crowded cities resembled more a military coup than a peaceful demonstration. Resentment resonated on the pages of national newspapers and magazines. Newsweek ran a story titled Harvest of Ill Will, predicting that if realized, AIM's goal of $5 a bushel wheat would raise consumer food prices by $10 billion. An editorial in the Washington Post titled The Farmer's Tantrum seasoned the prevailing sentiment with a pinch of sarcasm. Those people who live in the heartless cities may well wonder about the merits of the farmer's claims, particularly in view of the heartless inflation rate at the grocery store. The Post also published a comparative study of federal aid to an urban, single mother, African-American family of seven, surviving on less than $600 a month through welfare and food stamps, contrasted to a typical Kansas farm family who received $27,000 a year in subsidies. Conservative columnist James Kilpatrick, no friend to government entitlement programs, wrote that farmers' only hope was to work with consumers to suppress inflation. He wrote, by equating themselves with the hippies, yippies, long hairs, and loonies of the 60s, they have done a disservice to farming generally. If, as one organizer later claimed, 1979 was the year of the last great American protest, it was also the last chance for AIM to unite rural activists. AIM ambitiously hoped to transcend economic differences between grain and livestock producers, large farmers and small ones, Westerners and Southerners, all under the language of neo-populism. The national strike and tractor cade, however, proved these hopes unrealistic. Few farmers could afford not to plant. Hence, an actual increase in the cultivation of food and fiber occurred during 1978 and 79, which enlarged the country's already bloated surplus. After being labeled belligerent hooligans by the mainstream press, Ames membership dramatically declined. By the following summer, 90% of its local chapters had closed. The movement continued to operate through publication of AAN and a small lobbyist office in Washington, D.C. Overall, the public's hostile response provided for some a learning experience. For others, it produced a stubborn, recalcitrant form of rural nationalism. Having tried and failed to win urbanite support, AIM passed into the hands of the angriest, most ideologically driven activists. This was most pronounced on the high plains where the movement began. So probably everybody's been to or at least heard of Denver up in the top left. So um, I've tried to provide some map here to give um, identification of the locations I'll talk about. On January 1st, I'm sorry, January 4th, 1983, 300 farmers gathered in Springfield, Colorado. Um, right there. 300 farmers gathered in Springfield, Colorado to protest the sale of Jerry Wright's farm in Baca County. Wright owed more than $100,000 and had not made payments in years. So when a court-ordered auction of his property was announced, AIM leaders prepared the crowd days in advance with speeches and rallies. When the county clerk informed them that Wright's land had been sold to the Federal Land Bank, several farmers tried to push into the courthouse, leaving the sheriff little choice but to order the use of mace and tear gas. Arrests and injuries followed, with two men ultimately being prosecuted for assaulting police officers, but were later acquitted by a jury. After the U.S. Supreme Court ignored Wright's request to void the sale based on unconstitutionality, he took his case before TV audiences on shows like Nightline and Today. In May of that year, law enforcement officers expected an even larger crowd at the sale of Glenn Lewis's property near Sharon Springs, Kansas, 140 miles away. Um, Sharon Springs is kind of in the center and to the right a little bit. More than 200 police arrived on the scene, but the sale went smoothly despite Lewis's unsuccessful attempt to seize the auctioneer's loudspeaker and warn potential bidders about the hazards of what happens when a nation comes under a police state. 
Around this time, AAN, American Agriculture News, discontinued publication, citing a drop in subscriptions. Letters to the newspaper offer some explanation as to why. Declared one anonymous writer, I do not wish to continue my subscription to the American Agriculture News. I think if the Russians really want to take over America, as they once said, they would go about it exactly the way your newspaper advocates, that is, turning trusting, hardworking farmers against their government. Patricia Northrup from St. Francis, Kansas, had been involved in AIM from its inception, but wrote to say, quote, she was alarmed and angry that it had become a forum for anti-trilateralists, anti-gun controllers, and John Birchers. For heaven's sakes, Let's stop using a shotgun and rifle in our first and only AIM, 100% parity. Until we do, AIM is going to lose more and more support. That she identified this strain as early as August of 1978 during AIM's peak popularity, I think is telling. The February 1979 issue of American Opinion, which is the monthly periodical of the John Birch Society, featured a lead article titled, The Awakening Anger of Our Farmers. Birchers, who actually opposed AIM's goal of government parity, seized on rural hatred of marketing cartels and multinational finance. Once conspiracy propaganda found its way into AIM's speeches and publications, most farmers abandoned the movement, leaving the extremists to vent their rage through different means. In March of 1982, an incognito agent for the state attorney general's office and an undercover cop attended a three-day seminar on private land located north of Weston, Kansas. And that's where you see the little location signifier. With 55 paying men and women and one child in attendance, mercenaries and veterans of special armed forces conducted classes in camouflage, poisoning, construction of pipe bombs, knife fighting, and other forms of hand-to-hand -hand combat. Triggering media revelation of this was the arrest almost a year later of the landowner, Wesley White, on charges of explosives possession in Arapahoe, Colorado. White and his spouse, known tax protesters, apparently had attempted to purchase $5,000 worth of bombs and dynamite from undercover agents. Enter this group. Posse Comitatus, known in some circles as the Christian Posse, which traced its origin to the Pacific Northwest, where it was founded in 1969. Posse followers recognized only the first 12 amendments to the Constitution, reject, respected no law higher than the county sheriff, and in theory, refused to pay taxes or buy hunting, driving, and fishing licenses. Mike Beach, their lead publicist, expanded the group's reach by tying its ideology to Christian identity racism. But it was James Wickstrom, the head of a Wisconsin chapter, who first successfully linked them to the farm crisis. Wickstrom had timing on his side. His essay, American Farmer, 20th Century Slave, circulated among Tractorcade participants in February 1979, just as Congress and the media loudly criticized activist goals and behavior. American Farmer not only endorsed the strike, but it linked U.S. agricultural policy to Jewish conspiracies. In remarks to participants at the Weston Seminar, Wickstrom, Wickstrom described Kansas as the future Armageddon, the battle of the wheat fields, where family farmers, America's backbone, would make their final stand. His newsletter, Posse News Report, declared, food control is people control. And he warned that as inflation and high interest rates created unemployment, war would spill from suburbs to countryside. I'll read you a little gem. Remember, when the violence does break out, the blacks and other minorities will not be looking for TV sets and Cadillacs. They will be out for food and blood. But also remember, they are just the tools of the Jew bankers and corrupt politicians perpetrating a planned revolution. Posse Comitatus and AIM never merged, but they did overlap considerably in philosophy and membership. Some scholars claim the rise of apocalyptic survivalism as a desperate attempt by rural men to reclaim their honor and masculinity after traditional processes had failed. 
That analysis to me seems on point as a way of explaining the growing extremism. Prior to the farm crisis, the posse had been relatively obscure, dismissed by law enforcement as a bunch of crackpots who met in private homes once or twice a month to discuss eccentric ideas. Their profile rose considerably after a possible assassination attempt against Nelson Rockefeller, and that launched a subsequent FBI probe that revealed 78 chapters in 23 states. Rural people could easily overlook their racism and anti-Semitism, but turn a sympathetic ear toward its defense of rural America. Literally translated as power of the county, Posse Comitatus recognized descending steps of authority according to natural law, starting with God and following in order with Jesus Christ, the individual, family, group, people, community, county, state, and last, the national government. And notice the United Nations is nowhere even on that list. Since the individual recognized no human authority greater than oneself, the individual held ultimate responsibility for self-protection. Hence, adherents interpreted the Second Amendment literally as the right to carry firearms into any public space, a debate which we have certainly had recently. Chapters frequently issued citizens orders for arrest of government agents who tried to foreclose on property for debt or tax violation. Beach, Wickstrom, and others aggressively promoted these sentiments in speeches at foreclosure auctions, casual conversations in feedlots and grain elevators, in pamphlets distributed at after church Sunday socials, and on cassette tapes played at radio stations and heard around kitchen tables. James Wickstrom, whom you see here, pitched posse comitatus on the Great Plains by interweaving fears about racial degeneration with the emasculating effects of city life. A dose of nostalgia helped too. In The American Farmer, he contrasted the pre-New Deal America of 1929, when one quarter of white Christians lived on farms and could survive by raising their own food. Compared that to half a century later, when only 3% did so. In Wickstrom's writings, the, quote, inner city loomed large as a monolithic enclave for the unworthy and undesirable, prone to crime and dependent on government handouts. Wickstrom predicted government takeovers of farmland as a way to disperse minority populations into the countryside. Meanwhile, 20th century white farmers, in a reverse of 19th century racial hierarchy, would become the new slaves, producing food at a loss for parasitical urbanites. Posse circulars encouraged followers to fight against this by stockpiling enough food, for food, weapons, and ammunition for nine months. This theme of cities as breeding grounds for vice and revolution appeared frequently in racist literature, most notoriously in the Turner Diaries, a dystopian fantasy about a race war ignited by Jewish liberal conspirators. The work of white nationalist William Pierce, Turner Diaries gained wide circulation at auctions and gun shows following publication in 1978, but it remained unknown to most Americans until the 1995 Oklahoma City bombing when the book was revealed as an influence on terrorist Tim McVeigh. Starting in 1982, the Kansas Bureau of Investigation took seriously the posse's violent potential. A spate of letters was delivered to each of the state's 105 county sheriffs demanding the incarceration of specifically named judges who presided over foreclosures. The following February, the KBI hosted their own seminar in Salina, Kansas, to educate police and sheriff's officers about the dangers of right-wing militancy. More than 400 officials from six states attended, especially Colorado, where it was estimated that Posse Comitatus numbered more than 2,000 people in the counties between the Kansas border and the Front Range, the skinny little counties on the whale's tail that I showed you before. During the seminar in Johnson City, Kansas, let's not get confused, in the southwestern part of the state, a person claiming posse membership placed a phone call to the school superintendent and threatened to detonate an explosive unless the sheriff and undersheriff presented themselves in the middle of town to be hanged. Schools were closed, the students dismissed, and a search revealed no concealed bomb. In 1985, the FBI and Kansas Crime Prevention Association claimed 
that foreclosures in the Great Plains had boosted national posse membership to more than two million. The ABC TV program 2020 reported that the crisis in Iowa led to farmers patrolling back roads in camouflage, toting weapons, and preventing motorists from entering sparsely populated areas. Now it bears repeating that most Great Plains residents rejected this flamboyant message. As one founder of AIM in Baca County told me, we had some of those posse nuts try to infiltrate our meetings. We tolerated them a few times before we ran them off. But radical ideologies can become attractive and even mainstream when voiced by charismatic, politically savvy leaders. Much of the anger toward immigration, federal expansion, and liberal social values that has fueled the post-1970s new right was first articulated by rural extremists who found their voices during the crisis. For months in 1982 and 83, radio station KTTL-FM in Dodge City, headquarters of Cattle Country Broadcasting with one of the largest and most powerful signals on the Great Plains, aired speeches from Wickstrom and other posse spokesmen. I'll read you another little gem. If the Jews even fool around with us or try to harm us in any way, every rabbi in LA will die within 24 hours. Turn over your inheritance to the blacks and the Asiatics and you must allow all the scum of the earth to come into your land by destruction of your immigration laws. KTTL's owners, Nellie and Charles Babs, as a result of these broadcasts, faced an investigation by the Kansas Commission on Civil Rights and the FCC, which threatened to deny them their station's license renewal. The Babses eventually divorced, and the station was sold to new owners. Rumors about posse activities continued into the late 1980s, with some speculation about their spread into the Kansas City suburbs. Though its force as a movement was spent by 1990, Posse Comitatus provided much of the ideological foundation for the militias that proliferated over the following decade. Yet that same ideology, resistance to authority, the supremacy of the individual, proved a liability when it came to organizing. Participation declined after the Posse issued a call for registration fees, official charters, and monthly chapter dues. That's quite a departure from a group that's always insisted on decentralization. As with AIM, and to a lesser extent with WIFE, Posse Comitatus partly succeeded as a movement, but failed as an organization. Leaders discovered a pretty important lesson about farmers. They value their independence. And that value does not prepare them for long-term sustained collective fights. Despite shared grievances and a grudging acknowledgement that solutions might be found through unified action. That would mean, quote, not being American farmers anymore, having sacrificed their autonomy to join a union or some other centralized body. Kelly Clover of Silex, Missouri, considered herself a defender of small town life, <clears throat> someone that AIM might have recruited as an ally. But frankly, she wrote, like many other people, I have felt passed by by the Tractorcade organizers in more ways than one. In a thoughtful essay to AAN, Clover described farmers and their machinery rolling past homes and offices, past shopkeepers and laborers who work 10-hour days, past voters on street corners who might have cheered them forward if given incentive to do so, but they were not. Rightly or wrongly, there has been a big farmer's only image hung on AAM and all the good old boy cliques that seem to emerge in so many farm organizations. The small fights of small farmers to develop a dependable local livestock market, to hang on to a local school, to support a local elevator, to get or keep a doctor, or to develop a local industry that will provide jobs and a better small town economy, these are seldom the battles of agribusinessmen. Basically, Clover labeled AIM an elitist organization with few benefits for rural communities outside of rescuing indebted farmers who had overexpanded. Some activists themselves reached strangely similar conclusions, locating AIM's failure in the selfishness of farmers who were unwilling to rally behind causes they deemed irrelevant to their own prosperity and family, which I would argue is what happens when libertarianism is taken to its extreme. 
When we try to grasp the transformation of modern American agriculture, we would do well to try to understand how family farmers have redefined themselves. The equation of metropolitanism with sin and idleness, contrasted with the serenity and hard work of country life, predates Thomas Jefferson by generations. Philosophers from Thomas More in the 16th century to Jean-Jacques Rousseau in the 18th hailed cultivating the earth as the foundation of morally healthy societies. Heirs to that tradition, farmers of the late 20th century faced an unprecedented reality of a new metropolitan normal with themselves as the aberration. Employing tactics of dramatic protest proven effective by baby boomers a decade before, but lacking articulate spokespersons and appropriate symbols that could convince non-farmers of their plight, the new organization splintered and became exclusionary, even separatist. Less concerned with mainstream acceptance than with establishing a new cultural identity Many retreated to extremist behavior, if not to anti-government militias, then to baseball caps proclaiming proud redneck, or to an angrier style of country music typified in Hank Williams Jr.'s comforting lyrics, Country Folks Can Survive. An argument can be made that the trajectory of farm activism is not exceptional, that it follows a path well trod by other marginalized groups. The post-civil rights era has seen the phenomenon of urban flight, of middle-class whites and African Americans fleeing inner cities for the suburbs, taking with them their skills and resources, and leaving behind populations with shrinking tax bases who are more prone to poverty, hopelessness, and isolation. All of that holds true also for rural flight. When rural areas depopulate, it is the middle class that leaves the sector that historically provided balanced leadership and a politically moderate voice. Without those moderating influences, Great Plains conservatives can quickly transition from pragmatic politics to cultural reaction. As depopulation continues and the divide between blue and red states grows more pronounced, these angry voices are likely to escalate in intensity. Forgotten or misunderstood by the bicoastal nation around them, their number since the 1980s further reduced from minority to curiosity. Owners of family farms maintain their belief that rural areas remain the last bastions of true Americanism. Martyrs to the end for Mr. Jefferson's agrarian dream. Thank you. I think we have time for a few questions or comments. Yes, Andrew. How, how do you think the, the, the current representatives and senators play into this narrative, particularly the man who lies? Do I really have to answer that? <laughs> yeah. Well, I don't know if I can speak to those two in particular, but I, I think what Kansas politicians learned during the 1980s was that you have to at least appear to address farm and rural issues um, even when you're not. Um, the Attorney General of the time, Bob Steffen, launched quite an investigation into posse comitatus. And there seems to, that seems to have been the spark that ignited the National Rifles Association's interest in Kansas. Um, one thing that Steffen had proposed doing was to have some sort of an anti-militia law that would have given government more regulatory power over the sale of certain firearms, which these groups were apparently accumulating. And that, was, that seemed to be the moment when the NRA noticed a problem and began investing more heavily um, in this kind of rhetoric and in politicians who supported it. So I, I'd say overall it did produce kind of a, a sea change. So, mm -hmm. yeah. And it's a, it's a, consequently you're looking at very different kinds of conservative politicians than what you had prior. Other questions? Derek? Um, this is a question you talked to the 20th century mostly. I'm just, just wondering how, how anomalous is all of this, the reaction with the extremism? Uh, it sounds like more threats of violence than anything else. They can actually kill anybody they can see. But is this something that's 
without precedent, or something like this happened during the populist period, stuff like that, or is it, or is it unique because of the unique, you know, the globalization of you know uh, the economy and the fact that you know put smaller business out there? Is that something? Uh, you know? Two two ways I'll try to answer that. Um, there's a book I recommend by Catherine McNichol Stock called Rural Radicals. Very simple, easy title to remember in which she traces this back to as early as the 17th century with Bacon's Rebellion in Virginia, as well as Shays' Rebellion in the 1780s. And she would argue that this is actually part of a long-term historic trend in American history, especially American westward expansion. Uh, the other way I'll approach that is globally. Um, from what I understand, there are parts of Western China today that are experiencing something very similar. And if you look at parts of the, the hinterlands all around the world, there are these kinds of separatist philosophies that are popping up in rebellion against what's seen as controlled by the coasts. And so nobody's even close to trying to look at this in a comparative way, but I, I think it can be done. Yeah, good. Other questions? Brian. I have a comment and a question. Um, so first I want to say thank you for a fantastic presentation. Um, this. Uh, I think it's important for us to, to look at what has happened in the past as we learn about what's happening today and as we think more about how we deal with what's happening in today's political environment. Uh, this, was a, this was a really personal subject for me and I, I shared with Dr. Liker um, last week that um, I was coming because of my personal connection. My father was the district director in western Kansas during the 70s and 80s when this was all happening for the Federal Department of Agriculture. He was also the Kansas State Employees President for Federal um, Agriculture Employees. And so I, I, I recognized uh, what was happening. Uh, we were impacted as a family by the AIM uh, movement. We were impacted in a more hostile way by the Posse Comitatus. My father had citizen arrest uh, warrants put against him. We have death threats. Um, he had death threats. Um, he kept most of that quiet, but um, you know, my, my dad was a, an advocate for farmers. He grew up in a farm family. He was the youngest of nine people, or of nine kids, and he didn't get the farm, so he went into working in the Department of Agriculture. Um, I married a farmer's wife, so you know, I'm still proud of American farmers. This, I think it's important for us to remember this was a minority movement um, as, as activists, but uh, it was a per I had a personal connection to it. I lived through it, and I think it's important to shine a light on it. Um, I'd love to talk to anybody during the reception who had any personal experiences during this time, either as farmers, um, Department of Agriculture workers, um, and I'd, I'd love to hear some of your stories. My question is, as we, as we um, think about what's happening today, and you, I read the book Hillbilly Elegy, um, you know, you see the, the rise of um, disenfranchised rural people, um, uh, of which I'm from. I grew up in western Kansas uh, near Dr. Liker as well. Um, I wonder, what do we take away from, you've touched on some of it, what do, you, what do we take away from what we've learned here and how do we apply it today with an understanding of, of what's happening in, in culture? Well, that's another question I don't know that I have, the, I, can, I can answer very well. Um, there, there are, I think it's a cliche, but it's true that we're more divided now politically and culturally than we have been since the Civil War. And I don't pretend to have any solutions to that. But I do think that there's, well, I believe education is always important. And I, I think there needs to be perhaps more attempt for both sides to try to understand each other. Um, the number of Kansans who've never been on a farm or really understand what a combine is or have any kind of sense of what it's like to grow up in a town of you know, a few thousand people or a few hundred or a few dozen people um, is pretty amazing, despite our, the stereotype that people have outside of, us, outside of the state um, as being rural, we're a very urban state. So I think in some ways my own work and life have been an attempt to try to understand both that background that I came from and the environment in which I'm here now. I certainly have my sympathies, but I understand I think what's going on here in ways that perhaps somebody not from that environment would. So I know it's kind of a weak answer, but I frankly just think that talking to people in different sectors is a, a way to get at some of this. So, okay. Yes, Ben. Um, do you think that with the continuing depopulation of rural areas, rural counties, and rural areas, that the um, cultural divide will look 
increase or decrease? I think it will increase. I think it will continue to increase. But here's the thing. Depopulation eventually means nobody's left out there. Um, so in the meantime, what you're dealing with are people who are leaving those small towns and farms and they're moving to places like here. And they don't suddenly become metropolitan overnight, nor necessarily do their children. They're going to bring with them certain conservative values, certain ways of looking at the world um, that are going to linger in their own political behavior for quite some time. Um, I think Johnson County is kind of an interesting study in this because we're sort of at the nexus of where the city and the country meet and you've got this collision of different values that you see in local politics here. So uh, in some ways I think we're in sort of the, the testing lab for how all of this is going to work in the future. So maybe one more question. I didn't, I skipped supper tonight. So. I've got one. Sure. In American history, when were things actually great for farmers? <laughs> Well, the leaders of AIM would say World War I was pretty good. Well, right. Other than that, when, Other than that, when were things right. very good? Yeah. Well, when were things great is a relative term. I, I think there's a... Yeah, is, it a, is it a difficult profession? I, I, I think it was always difficult, but I think before the market revolution, when agriculture was practiced for local self-subsistence, I think it was a different time period. I think as farming has become more attached to global markets, it's more vulnerable to changes in the weather, more changes to diplomatic processes. Um, why on God's earth would you want to keep investing into something that's so, so iffy? And yet people cling to it, not because it makes good business sense, because it's a way of life. And that has always been under attack. It's been under increased attack in the last few decades. When was it great? I don't know that it was ever great. 1917 is the best I can do, but it might have been good. I just know it's gotten worse. So, okay. Okay, well, thank you very much for coming. So, mm -hmm.